Welcome everyone to chapter 11 of Shmuel Bet. We are learning David and Batsheva part one. Yes, we finally made it to the main event of uh, Shmuel Bet. Much uh, people, uh, that's what I want to talk about, which is most people read Navi. When you read Navi, just the text, if it's just the Hebrew or you're reading the English, if you read it without understanding our rabbinic tradition, you will think that David is the worst person imaginable. And how can this person, the king of Israel, David HaMelech, David Kayam, David, king of Tehillim, David, Shavuot, all the things that we think of. And I tell you, here is a classic thing where I need to tell you, do not understand a story in Tanakh if you've never learned rabbinic commentary. Rabbinic commentary is not coming to whitewash David. Rabbinic commentary is coming to explain to you the oral tradition, to tell you, here is how we understand it. The story here is not coming to tell you, did David sentence a man to death and put him on the front line? Yes, Uriah was killed by David's order. You know, but the question of, did David commit adultery, which is what it looks like in the text, our rabbinic tradition is extremely different and nuanced. And here we're going to find, and we learn next week, chapter 12, the punishment or the punishments which David receives is not for murder and adultery. He is punished because as a king, he has acted immorally. And that is what we're going to discuss and explain. But I want to give you that introduction because I think this is a classic chapter where when we do not understand our rabbinic tradition, we misinterpret our heroes of Tanakh. Now, this doesn't mean that there isn't time for censure for David. It means we have to understand what we're censoring him for. What, are we, what is our critique of him? And the critique is, as a man of power, he took what he wanted. That is the critique, not that he murdered someone and he committed adultery. We're saying that Uriah is actually guilty of going of insubordination, and so therefore, or, or treason, and so there, treason to the king, and so therefore he had, was in his rights to have him killed. He was in his rights to take Bathsheba because, as we'll see, Bathsheba was not technically married to Uriah. However, just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should do a thing. That is the lesson of this chapter. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And therefore, what is Hashem saying to David? You chose to do something you shouldn't have done. And because you did that, you have caused a chilul Hashem, a desecration of my name, and therefore I'm going to punish you publicly so that you realize that you, as king of Israel, have a different role. That in a snapshot is chapters 11 and 12. Now we're gonna go into detail into chapter 11, and next week we'll look at chapter 12. Here we go. I hope you're all sitting comfortably. Vahi l'tshuvat hashana, and it was at the return of the year. Le'et set ha-melachim, at the time of the going out of kings, vayishlach David et Yoav, and David sent Yoav. Ve'et Avadav Imo and his servants with him, Ve'et Kol Yisrael and all of Israel, Vayashchitu et Bnei Ammon, and they destroyed the people of Ammon, Vayatsuru al Rabbah, and they besieged Rabbah. The David Yoshev Birushalayim, and David dwelt in Jerusalem. And there's a number of questions on this pasuk. Obviously, the beginning we all know from my classes now. Vayi. And it was, we're going to have something bad is going to happen with Vahi. Now, by the way, it's also Vahi in Pasuk Bet, so you know it's doubly going to be bad. But it's telling us a year has passed since the events of last year, of, of uh, chapter 10, and we're told that kings go out. But instead of kings going out, David sends Yoav. And David, he dwells in Jerusalem. 
And I'm focusing on those phrases because if we look here at, uh, at Rashi and Malbim, they say this. That Rashi says there is a time of the year that it is customary for the armies to go out to war when the land is filled with storks and the horses find grain in the fields to eat. And then Malbim says, this scripture implies was the reason David erred with Bathsheba. Why? He should have gone out to battle, but didn't. David was not worn out from battle, as he'd already had a full year to recuperate. Nor could it be said it wasn't the time that kings go out to war. Despite all this, David sent Yoav while he remained in Jerusalem. What is the text telling us here? The text is saying, primarily and fundamentally, why did the Yetzirah get to David? Because David was idle. When you're not doing things, when you're not busy, in this case, David running the, running the, run, running the country or fighting the battle, that's when bad things happen, or that's when the Yetzirah seduces you and makes you make moral failings, okay? That is the point here. There's a time in the springtime, this is a time for war. And not to get political, why is Hamas attacking Israel? Because this is the time, it's the springtime. That's when people get restless and that's when they want to fight. And instead of going out to fight, David's dwelling in Jerusalem. And then it says in Pasuk Bet, and here's the kicker, Vahi la'et ha'er, when it was close to evening or afternoon, Vayakom David ma'am mishkavo. David got up from his bed, i.e. David had taken an afternoon nap. Vayithalech al gag beit ha'melech, and he was walking on the roof of the palace. Vayar isha rochetzet mal ha'gag, and he could see from walking on top of the roof, there was a woman who was bathing. Vayisha tova ma'e ma'od, tovat ma'e ma'od, and this woman was very beautiful, okay? And you could all think of that song, and I'm not going to sing it because I'm a bad singer, but you know that song, uh, and the Baffled King composeth, okay? All that kind of stuff. What's going on here? If you look at the commentary again on this, on this verse, it's going to point out all of these things. The Malbim writes, even in his home, he wasn't preoccupied with matters of state since he'd been sleeping in the afternoon. He got up, and went on a leisurely stroll on the roof of his palace. It was because of this that he came to transgression that he saw a woman bathing. So here are commentaries the Malbim specifically is telling you. As a king, you need to lead the army. If you're not going to lead the army, then you need to be busying yourself with matters of state, or dare I say it, Talmud Torah. But when you have these long days and you're free to do whatever you want, and we're hearing that David's taking afternoon naps and long evening strolls, it's telling you he's enjoying the finer things. And therefore, Hashem says they sends the Yetzirah, sends the evil inclination to tempt David. All of this is letting us know that uh, what's going on so far is a little bit and I dare say a little bit, I'm being, uh, I'm being kind, this is giving you all these extra words here. They're foreshadowing what the issue is for David. Now, Pasuk Gimel says something very interesting. It says, Vayishlach David, Vayidrosh la'isha, Vayomer, Halo zot bat sheva, bat eliam, eshet uria hachiti. And David sent... And he inquired about the woman, and he said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And here is something that we have to understand. What is this extra language being used? And how on earth would he know? Is this Bathsheba? And then we're going to mention who her father was and who her husband was. What's all this extra information being provided for us? If we look, I mean, we're going to look here at the Radak. The Radak quotes 
a the Zohar and the Kabbalah, and this is brought down in Midrash, that David inquired, is this woman Batsheva, is this the woman that I am destined to marry? And I want to focus a little bit on this, which is, according to our rabbinic tradition, in the most mystical of our tradition, the Zohar, David was always meant to marry Batsheva. Batsheva was going to be the mother of Shlomo HaMelech, the mother of David's son, Shlomo, who would build the Bet HaMikdash. He knew that through Ruach HaKodesh. That is the Kabbalah. And what is the Kabbalah telling me? What is Zohar telling me? The Zohar is telling me the sin of David was that he took her at the wrong time. He didn't realize that he should have engaged in, with, with her only once her husband Uriah had died and not before. Now this is striking. If it tells you that David sinned, but David sinned because he took her too early. It's almost trying to what? Not whitewash, but explain why David made the mistake, which is, if I know through Ruach HaKodesh, I'm going to marry so-and-so, but I don't know when I meant to marry so-and-so, and then I'm introduced to her, like, uh, you know, you bump into her in the street, you think, oh, maybe now is the time. I don't know. It's, it's an interesting, I want to bring that Radak, just because, I haven't brought, if I, the Ma'am Loez, the Radak, Rashi, the, the Art Scroll, everyone is going through this piece of Zohar, which is, it's one of the most well-known pieces of Zohar, that David was always predestined to marry Bathsheba. Bathsheba was always going to be the mother of Shlomo HaMelech. If that's the case, this isn't just a situation of pure lust going on here. Is there lust involved? Yes. Is that the only reason? Clearly not. And then if we have a look here at the uh, Mamloez, it says here, because, sorry, Batsheva is called Batsheva, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. It can be understood that since the verse mentions her father first, that Batsheva was divorced. Now this whole concept of Batsheva being divorced and what is happening here, we're going to see in the later commentaries. This is a comment which is brought back by the Radak, by Rashi, by the Midrash, by the Gemara. We're going to see it. This is very primary. This is the Torah Sheba'al Peh and the way that it understands this story, that when soldiers go out to war, no matter who it is, it wasn't Uriah the Hittite, but every single soldier, when they went out to war, they knew they could die in battle. But more importantly, more than being KIA, they knew they could be MIA, they could be missing in action. And therefore, in order to resolve a, a situation of Agunot, they would give their wives bills of divorce, and the bill of divorce would work and say, if I do not return, i.e. if I die in battle, you are divorced from now, from right now before I leave, before I go out to battle. Okay, this is an important thing, this retroactive divorce situation, because what it allows for uh, is this situation that uh, what David did, although reprehensible and though morally wrong, he's not doing adultery. Now, the point of view of, are the rabbis whitewashing it? You could argue yes, and you could say, this whole thing of agunot and rabbis, by the way, it's not a 21st century problem only, this was something, but it really was a problem in the time of the Mishnah and Gemara. They really did want to resolve the issue of agunot. Now, the question is, was that an issue in biblical times as well? You could say no, and the rabbis are whitewashing, or you could say absolutely. This was a problem 
always, and it was just, it was codified and written down in, in, oral, in oral law, in the Mishnah and the Talmud, when it got written down, but it was always an issue. And for that, you can argue, and we could get professors in here, and you can bring in rabbis, but I'm saying you don't have to say that it's whitewashing. You could really say agunot has always been a problem in Jewish law, right from the beginning throughout the Tanakh, and not just a Tanaitic or Amoraic problem, and certainly not just a 21st century issue that we talk about it today. Now, if we continue and jump into Pasuk Dalad, we're going to see an interesting verse. It says here, Vayishlach David Malachim, David sent messengers, Vayikacheha, and he took her, Vatavo elav, and she came to him, Vayishkavima, and he lay with her, vehi mitkadeshet mitumata. And by the way, you should know that she was already at this stage purified from her ritual impurity. Vatashov el beta. And she returned to her home after this. Now, on this verse that she was pure, she, she was ritually pure from her ritual impurity, Rashi says, what was the issue? That she was. She, she, that she had, she was uh, pure from her menstrual impurity. And here the Radak says, David was neither guilty of sleeping with a woman while she was still in Nida, nor, as our rabbis explain, was he guilty of sleeping with a married woman, because each soldier that went out to war gave a bill of divorce uh, to his wife, that if he dies in battle, she would be divorced retroactively. What this is coming to tell us is, don't just think of this as a narrow, that why was she bathing? She was bathing because she'd finished her seven clean days and she was going to the mikveh and she was having a ritual bath. Don't just see it like that, which it was obviously, but also that he was not guilty of adultery, the other form of of, uh, of ritual impurity, which is just as a man cannot have relations with a woman who is a nida, so too he cannot have relations with an eshet ish, with a married woman. And so therefore it's telling us David was free from this ritual impurity, both eshet ish, a married woman, and also a nida. And why is he telling me this? Why is the Radak wanting to bring this down? If it's true that she was a married woman, not only would she be forbidden to him now, she would be forbidden to him for all time. And therefore, even when Uriah would be killed, he would still not be allowed to marry her. He certainly would not allow to be, you know, at best she could be a concubine, but certainly he would not be allowed to have her be the mother of the future king of Israel. So that is why, that is the motivation for Rashi, Radak, the Midrash, the Torah Shabal Peh. It's inconceivable, it's not possible to understand it any other way. And we go here to Pasuk Hay, and the woman conceived, and she told David, and she said, I am pregnant. And now here we see the first mistake of David. By the way, often we compare David to Yehuda, because it was Yehuda who admitted his mistake. Now, what's interesting about Yehuda is Yehuda admitted his mistake the moment he found out that he was the father of her child. That was the moment that he said, Khatati, and he admitted publicly that he was the father of Tamar's unborn children. Okay, now that's important for us because here, when David is told privately, just like Yehuda was told privately by Tamar that I am pregnant and you are the father, David here does not want to hide it. Okay, so he wants to hide it. He doesn't want to tell the truth. He waits. He does come to a senses, but I do want you to understand he is not on the same level as Yehuda. Because Yehuda, when he hears it, he comes 
straight away and says, I am the father. Here, the Malbim says, Batsheva conceived. The Zohar writes that Uriah went out to war and gave her a get, a bill of divorce, on the 7th of Sivan. And this episode happened on the 24th of Elul. This made it abundantly clear, since it was over three months later, this made abundantly clear that it was David who was the father and not Uriah the Hittite. Now, understanding that, what would we expect David to do? Not to have Uriah killed. But that's exactly what he does. As Vav says, Vayishlach David el Yoav, David sent to Yoav, Shlach elayit Uriah Hachiti, send to me Uriah the Hittite, Vayishlach Yoav et Uriah el David. And Yoav sent Uriah to David. Now what's the motivation behind David asking for Uriah to be sent back from the battlefront. He doesn't want to hear stories of battle from him. So what's going on? Rashi explains David intended that Uriah would lie with his wife so it'd be assumed that she had conceived from him. And so therefore he's like, okay, everyone's going to know it is. Uriah is the father. They're not going to suspect me. Abar Banel adds, David commanded Uriah, oh, we'll skip that, we'll, we'll get there. Sorry. We have to read a couple more psukim before we go to the Abarba now. But uh, what we're hearing from here is David's first response is to cover it up. That is his first position. When he's called out by Nathan, by Nathan, in the next chapter, he does admit it straight away. But here, before being called out by the Navi, he tries to hide. Okay, he tries to hide it. He wants Uriah to sleep with his wife. It says here, we're going to read a few psukim here, he's Zion. Vayavo Uriah elav, and Uriah came to him. Vayishal David l'shalom, and David asked him how he was doing, how Yoav was doing, l'shalom ha'am, how the people are doing, l'shalom ha'am, and how the war is going. Vayomet David l'Uriah, and then Uriah said, to, then David said to Uriah, Reid l'Beitcha, go down to your home, Urchatz raglecha, and wash your feet. Vayetze Uriah mi Beit HaMelech, Vatetze Acharav Masat HaMelech. And Uriah went out from the king's palace, and he went after him, they sent him a, a, a royal feast, Masat HaMelech. Okay, they sent him the king's food. There was a two interpretations of what this means. Some say it was uh, a, a feast. The other, they sent him torches to make sure that he would find his way back to, uh, to his house. But Tet says, Vayishkav Uriah Petach Beit HaMelech. Uriah went to sleep at the entrance of the palace at Kol Avdonav with the rest of the servants of, 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 of his lord, Veloya Radabito, but he did not go to his home. So what was David's plan? If we go down to the commentaries there, we're going to look at the, the Abravanel. Abravanel says, here's what he says to him, David commanded Uriah to wash his feet, this is a euphemism for tashmish mita, for marital relations. This was not befitting for Uriah to do. He felt it was beneath his dignity and honor to be with his wife while his brothers were fighting. Now here, this is a very noble thing of Uriah. Okay, I've been asked to go down by the king to sleep with my wife, and I'm not going to do it. Why? How can I eat and have a feast? and sleep with my wife when my fellow combatants are fighting. So far, this is not showing disrespect to David. But here we're going to see where it does become disrespectful. Pasuk Yud and Yud Aleph. Let's have a look. It says here, Vayagidu le David lemon. It was told to David saying, Lo yarad Uriah el beito. David, Uriah didn't go down to his home. Vayomet David el Uriah. And David said to Uriah, Hello mi derech ataba. Haven't you come from a long journey? Madua lo yarad el beitecha. Why didn't you go to your home? Vayomet Uriah el David. Now listen to this. 
Uriah said to David, Ha'aron ve'Yisrael ve'Yehudai yoshevim basukot. The ark, the Jewish people of Yisrael and Yehuda are dwelling in Sukkot, in huts, in booths, in temporary dwellings. Vadoni Yoav, and my Lord Yoav, Avde Adoni, and the servants of my Lord, Al Pnei Hasadeh Chonim, are encamped on open field. Vani Avoel Beti, and I shall go to my home. To eat and to drink, and to sleep with my wife. By your life and by your soul, if I should do such a thing. Here, notice the words. What does he say? He says, Adoni Yoav, my Lord Yoav. What does that mean, my Lord Joav? Meaning, I have more respect for the commander of these forces than I do to the king. Okay, I'm just looking at, uh, Rob's added a note here. Wash your feet is what Abraham told his visitors to do. David is asserting his dominance over Uriah's home by saying, wash your feet. It means Uriah is the guest and David is the owner of the house. Wow, that's an even better interpretation, which is even more so, which could be, dare I say it, by that interpretation, Rob, perhaps what's going on there is that uh, perhaps Uriah already knows that something is up, that he's already thinking to himself, why is he so interested in my affairs? Now, before we go into more of that, let's just look at the classic understanding of this. The Ma'am Loes says, quoting... Uh, the Rishonim, my master Yoav, Uriah was guilty of rebellion, insurre- not insurrection, but disrespect. Some say he displayed a lack of kavod for David by mentioning Yoav before the king. Others suggest the mere fact that he referred to Yoav as his lord while in David's presence was an act of disrespect. Alternatively, his refusal to follow the king's command to return home, that's Uriah's culpability. Now, what does David want to do? He's going to try one more thing. He's going to try and uh, get him drunk. But before that, I mean, after that, eventually he's going to uh, send him to his death in the battlefront. Now, why? Uriah the Hittite, you have smitten with the sword, means that you could have judged him before the Sanhedrin as one guilty of treason against the throne, and you did not judge him in that manner. Instead, you had him executed in a manner that deviated from the generally accepted principles of judgment, which is, what was David's motivation? David's motivation was hiding from the world the fact that he had slept with Bathsheba. If he wanted to punish Uriah for insubordination, for disrespect, we have a Sanhedrin for that. And he could have been charged for it, and he could have been killed by having him murdered. Well, not murdered, but having him killed by the people of Ammon. What's he doing? He's saying, I didn't do anything. I'm not punishing him for insubordination. I just had him. He just died on the battlefront. That's the issue here. David is punished not for adultery. David is punished for hiding it, for doing it beseter, for doing it in chadre chadarim, hiding it in the innermost chambers, not because of anything, not because of adultery, not for murder, but because he was hiding it. And then we continue here. Vayikralo David. And David called him, Vayochalafanab, and he ate before him, Vayesht, and he drank, Vayshakrehu, and he made him drunk. And even in his drunken stupor, he still would not go down and sleep at home with his wife. He still went to sleep with the rest of the servants in the palace. 
and it was in the morning. Oh, so we'll get to that before David sends him to the front lines. Here we go. Ma'am Loez, David tried another method to get Uriah to sleep with Bathsheba. He gets him drunk, but this too did not work. So David was forced to send Uriah to the front lines. Okay, in his, des- in his desperation, his plans to have Uriah as a drunk man sleep with his wife did not work. And so therefore, he had nothing else to do but send him to the front lines. Now here, it says, Vahi Vapok, it was in the morning, and again, my friends, Vahi, and it was telling you that something bad is going to happen to Uriah. Vahi Vapok, it was in the morning, Vahitov David, Sefer El Yoav, and David wrote a message to Yoav, Vaishlach Biyad Uriah, and he sends it in the hand of Uriah. 15, he wrote in the message saying, Place Uriah at the forefront of the fiercest battle and leave him there so that he will be hit and he will die. Now, what's interesting here is David is sending the message with Uriah. The Abravanel says, this is testimony to Uriah's integrity and honesty, that David trusted Uriah with a letter and that he would not read it on the way to the front. Rashi Tishmu Albet on Pasuk uh, Tevav says, in order, why is he having him killed? In order she should be retroactively divorced and consequently, he would not have had relations with a married woman. For anyone who departs to war, writes his wife a divorce on condition that he die in battle. Okay, so again, Rashi, again, quoting what we've already seen in the Radak and what we've seen in, in the, what we've talked about in the Midrash and in the Gemara. Okay? Now, let's see the rest of these Psukim. Vaihi, again, something bad. Again, all this is preambling to it. Bishmor, it came to pass when Yoav kept watch, Yoav el Ha'ir on the city, Vayiten et Uriah el Hamakom Ashe Yada, Yanche Chayel Sham. He assigned Uriah to the place where he knew that there were strong men there. Vayetsu and Shehair, and the men of the city came out, Vayilachamu et Yoav, and they warred with Yoav, Vayipol min ha'am avdei David, and there people from the, from, from the servants of David died, Vayamot gam Uriah chitei, and also Uriah the Chittite died. Vayishlach Yoav, Vayaged le David, kol divrei ha'milchama. And David was sending war correspondence back to the king, to David, to tell him how the war was going. Vayitzav et ha'malach, and he sent the messenger Lemor saying, Exactly like this. This is how when you finish telling the words of the war, you should tell the king, you should say as follows. If you see that the king becomes angry, because of the fact that so many people have died. And he will say to you, why did you approach the city to wage battle? Did you not know that they would shoot from upon the wall? And he says here, Don't you remember all the way back in Shofetim, who killed Avimelech, the son of... Gidon, who's here, he's called Yerubesha to Yerubal. Halo isha hishlicha lav pelach rechev. Don't you remember that a woman threw a millstone over him? From over the wall, vayamot, betevetz, and he died in tevetz? Lama nigash temelachoma? Why did you go so close to the wall? Ve'amarta, then you should say to him, gam avdecha uriah hachiti met. Your servant uriah the Chittite, also died. Vayelech HaMelech, and the servant came, Vayavo, Vayaged David, and he told David, Kol Asher Shelcho Yoav, all that Yoav told him. 
ויאמר המלך אל דוד, ומלך, the messenger said to David, כי גברו עלינו האנשים, ויצאו אלינו השדה, ונהיה עליהם על פתח השער. And the messenger said, when the men prevailed over us and came out against us to the field, then we came upon them as far as the entrance of the gate. ויורו המורים אל עבדיך מעל החומה, וימותו מעבדי המלך, וגם עבדך אוריח איתי מת. And the shooters shot at your servants from upon the wall, and some of the king's servants died, and also your servant Uriah, the Hittite, is dead. ויאמר דוד אל המלאך, and David said to the messenger, so we should say to your av, Don't let this thing make you sad. Because this is how the sword devours. Strengthen your battle. on the city. You should destroy it. And you shall strengthen him. And he should know, don't lose sight. Don't feel bad about this. Everything will be good. Vatishma eshet Uriah, ki met Uriah ishah, vatispod al bala. And Uriah's wife heard that her husband had died, and she mourned her husband. Vayavo ha'evel vayishlach David, vayasfa el beito, ותהי לו לאישה, ותלד לו בן. ויירא הדבר אשר עשה דוד בעיני אדוני. And the morning period passed, and David sent and gathered her to his house, and she became his wife, and she bore him a son. And this thing that David did was displeasing to Hashem. It was bad, okay? It was evil in the eyes of Hashem. Okay, and so we can see here that I concluded with a commentary by myself. David was not guilty of adultery of murder or of murder, but his behavior was immoral. This was abhorrent to Hashem and David needed to do teshuva for it. That is the message of this chapter, which is just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you must do, do a thing. Just because David wasn't technically guilty of adultery or murder, he did the next best thing. And that is wrong in the eyes of Hashem, and he is going to be punished for it. And we're going to talk about this more next week. But what I will not have is people reading the text and not understanding that. Because people read the text and they just sing, oh, look at David. He's an adulterer. He's a murderer. He's a this, he's a that. No, that, no, he's not. But he is going to have the punishments and the punishments which he himself says he deserves. And that we will discuss next week. Friends, do you have any comments or thoughts? We, we're just, uh, sorry, just, we have a uh, siren going off right now, so. It's a, uh, wow. it's a boom, so. I don't know if you can hear it, but thought maybe you'd like the experience. Wow, wow, but Saratova, Elliot, we're with you. Wow. All right, well, I'm gonna check out. Have okay. a Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Elliot, but Saratova. Okay. All right, friends, that's it for today.